Okay, so open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. You can find that. And I want to make this uh, statement, and uh, it will be my, my phrasing of this concept and idea. That is that we can't, with the same mind that we've always had, read Scripture and expect to get something different out of it. We have to change our mind. Yes. We have to. Yes. Can and the things that we we'll share are out of the box of the mind that we've always thought with it's right. concerning yes. Scripture. <laughs> or could, I'll say concerning the Hebrew Scriptures especially. And I would say that if we were thinking with a different mind, we would realize that that's the foundation of the New Testament, so-called New Testament Scriptures. Because, I, you know, I've made a statement many times, there is no Old Covenant and New Covenant and that's out of the box completely of what we've always been taught because we all we are not under the old covenant; we're under a newer covenant. That yet, that's not uh, that's not exactly true. Uh, I'll make this. I'll also make this statement maybe several times. I hope that the King James translation of the Bible, King James, had forty-seven supposedly scholars to put together this compilation that's so popular that we all use. Three of those 47 scholars were Hebrew, but they were not Hebrew scholars. They were Hellenistic Hebrews. Hellenistic Hebrews were the Hebrew people who had actually come out of the ancient language and were dressing the Hebrew language in Greek <coughs> dress. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so two of the three Hebrew scholars died before half of the Old Testament was even put together. So all I'm just simply saying is when we look at the King James translation and all of us are ingrained in that. All of us. We, we don't even realize that we think that. It doesn't matter what English translation that you use. New American Standard, New Revised Edition, New International. It doesn't matter. They all come from the King James in, in this era, this time we live right now. They didn't come from the ancient Hebrew, the original Hebrew. But yet, it's still here. See, that's, that is that is su such a uh, catch-22 thing. Yeah. It's still here, but you have to dig in to find it. In other words, you can't read the word Lord and get what the Hebrew meant when it used the phrases yod heh bab -Hey. You can't get out of Lord what that meant. Yeah. And if we're trying to get out of the word Lord what the original Hebrew meant, we never can get there. And so I know it's difficult at first simply because it requires a different mind. It requires to think different. And so I'm going to say some things that I know is contrary to most of the things that we all have been taught and that we all basically believe about ourself. And I, and I think many times that becomes a root of our problem are the things that we believe about ourselves and the things that we do believe about ourselves we yeah. basically we've been taught from Christianity and from yes. the, the scriptures that have been butchered up taken away from added to or changed but yet again I will say this again for, and to me and for me and I realize I think that the Bible is the most important book probably on the face of the earth even though it's not looked at that way it's looked at less and less as far as importance but I think the further that biology grows and expands it's going to prove the ancient Hebrew that's always been here so that we can go if we can learn to go in here and see what it truly said it's saying what biological science is saying now about the body about the human body so so I, you know, I, I, I know there are so many different ways to approach this but let's just read through it and I'll I want to point out a few things just reading through it and then I'm going to come back and we'll do some dialogue on it. So Genesis 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light 
God called the light. I could say it this way. I could say the Hebrew word light is or. God called the light what? Day. Exactly. So what is a day? What is day? That's the Hebrew word yom. What is it? It's light. light. Exactly. Yeah. Now you've been taught that day is a 24-hour period of time. It doesn't say that. It said day is light. It's really important if you can get that. So the Hebrew word yom actually is a interchange for the Hebrew word or. Hebrew word or is the word for light. The Hebrew word yom is the word translated for day but doesn't mean day. Well, what does it mean, Brother Lynn? It means light. It tells you that right there. So every place that you're going to read the word day here, you'll read it seven times. Every place, it's really the word light. It's the word or. Well, if we really do uh, Hebrew research on the word yom and the word light, what we will find out is actually that word means life, L-I-F-E, abundance of life, happy life, long life, and actually the words are used that way. But yet we have been told that this is a seven day period of time, seven yom, yeah. of a creative aspect, and it's not. Actually, if I were going to break this down, I would break it down into four divisions. Why would I do that? Well, I, I have a note here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, somewhere I have a note. I, I'm not even sure if I have it on on these pages. Uh, where did I put that? I'd sure like to read you that note. It's about the uh, everything in this world is made up from four letters. Bi biology is proving this. If you listen to Deepak Chopra, if you listen to Bruce Lipton, you're going to hear this especially from the, from the quantum science or those who are like Bruce Lipton who is an epigenetic biologist and when he uses the word epi, epi is a Greek word. Like for instance in the New Testament they use the word epiranus, epioranus or epiranus, have you ever heard of that word? It's the word for heaven. It's not referring to our concept of what heaven is. Nor in ancient Hebrew is the word shamayim that's translated heaven. Does it mean our concept of what heaven is? So in, that, in reality, we don't even have a clue what heaven is. You know what? Because we've been dumbed down to think that it's something, a celestial place out yonder. It's yeah. a place of uh, bliss. It's a... It's a glorified, paradoxical, paradise earth. Yeah. That's what we've all been taught. That's right. And it's, it's way out yonder somewhere. And that's not true. So we have been taught all of these concepts and ideas, and we think through them concepts and ideas, and as we continue to think through them, we can't extract what this is saying, and we can't get to the truth. And, I, you know, and for me, boy, I wish I could find that. I think those, those letters are... A, A, E, T, and C. Uh, they they stand for four gases, and you'll hear, like I said, you'll hear uh, Bruce Lipton, you'll hear uh, Deepak Chopra, quite a number of different scientists. Or if you just go on and you just you just Google the four gases that you're made up of. Well, in ancient Hebrew, those are English. Those are English letters. Those English letters stand for those different gases. In Hebrew, there were four, also, four Hebrew glyphs or letters. And the four Hebrew glyphs or letters stood for the same thing. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen stood for the four gases. So, by the sciences now, they know that, uh, that we are made up of these four gases. They know that. And so, uh, I'll find those. I have them wrote in. A, I have them wrote down in a pad somewhere, which I thought I had it here, but I do not see it. Yeah, it must be must be one that I left right there. Mm -hmm. Too much. 
Would it be on that time? Yeah, here we are. Every one of us as human beings are made up of atom, A-T-O-M. Those are, these are building blocks. Mm -hmm. Now, um, amino acids, these are uh, gases, different things. It, and microbiology is knowing this. They don't know how that it works. They just know that it does work. They don't know how that uh, we, they can't explain it, but they can define many of the things that they know. They can't explain life. They just know it is. It, it is. So every one of us as humans are made of atom, A-T-O-M, which is what the word atom, A-D-A-M, means. Okay? Atom, it be, it's it being, it, st it started our life as it started all life, no matter what life, even to the to the lowest, lowest the, the smallest micro living thing, whatever, just a little glob in the ocean. It still is made up of these these four uh, gases. I, I don't care what they are, as well as we, everything. And so it's and they these four gases. It started out from four gases known as PNA. And we heard most people heard of RNA, heard of DNA, but what PNA? Well, PNA is what builds RNA. RNA is a single strand that builds a DNA. And when we look at that, we, got, we can begin to see that. You see, when a male releases his seed, that seed has RNA in it. That egg has RNA in it, and when that seed penetrates into that egg, then it creates what's called a double helix, and that's a DNA. Okay? But all of these things that, and, and you know, like I said, microbiologists are chasing a lot, lot of this stuff down into the smallest, minutest particles. And so they found out that it comes from PNA, which actually means peptide nucleatic acid. That's what that word means, peptide nucleatic acid. And these uh, four gases are known as A, T, C, and G. A for adenine, T for thiamine, C for cyt cytosine, and G for guanamine. Those are the four gases. All of those gases, those four gases, builds everything that is. I don't care what it is, whether it's a whale, whether it's a fly or a gnat, a rabbit or a dog, or a human being. Builds them off. These four nucleotides. The four can be taken over into the Hebrew as yod he vav he And that'll become important, you know, later as we begin to open our eyes. You know, and a companion we have to this, and I'm, I will try, maybe, I'm not sure I will this morning, this afternoon, maybe I want to try to uh, pull some things from the what we know of, we call it the Song of Solomon because it's an important book and to me it's a companion book of Genesis and so we have to look at them together there are many companion books that if we put them together then we can see clearer see the picture a little bit clearer than what we've seen before so the four letters in the Hebrew alphabet are Yod, He, Vav, He and we, we could say carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen and oxygen which are the same thing as these four acids that we're getting, the gases. So amino acids are the building blocks for all of life, no matter where we, where we look for life. Uh, the machinery inside a cell, so you're, you're here in Genesis, in Genesis 2, uh, Genesis 1, look, just flip the page to Genesis 2, and I want to show you a word here. Uh, let's see, where is that at? Verse 21, Genesis 2, 21 says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep. Well, that, you know, that's a, that's a, to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of the ribs. You see the word rib there? Yeah. Should have been sail. Because a rib, actually a rib is a sail. Should have, that's, that's actually how it should have been translated. It should have been a sail, because it's a sail is a building block and the intricacy of it right now as far as uh, microbiologists that it's it's just it's so it's it's just so intrinsic that they can't explain it. it I mean it's just so much to it. It's something as small as a little bitty cell. 
And so that little cell is from these acids or gases. That's what creates and builds that cell, these acids and these gases. What uh, we have is known today as the DNA, uh, a dual strand of acids that stems to have come, seems to have come from a single strand, an RNA. In other words, every one of us got our life from one strand from our father and one strand from our mother, period. So and that, that ATGC, is that what? Yes. That's, that's the letters of... ATCG. That's the, the... They stand for... Between the, the two helix, or the two strands of DNA, that's those letters going between those. That's exactly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's exactly I forget what that's called. Right. But. Yeah. Okay. Go back over here with Genesis 1 with me. Just kind of go slow and we'll teach or whatever. We're just try to, trying to renew our mind, trying to put a new mind on. And, that, and that's what I'm... So I want you to pay a lot of attention. Verse 5, And God called the light day. God called it day. Or. And that's what, uh, that's what those acids are they're actually they come from light they come from light light particles and those light particles it's you know they uh the biologists are beginning to see more and more that for me if they would go back and study ancient hebrew they say oh wow they knew that they knew that five thousand years ago <laughs> they wrote it down here but we just haven't we haven't seen it but it's here and god called the light day the darkness he called night, the evening and the morning were the first. Were the first day. And that, that word that's used here for first, it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean first like as we use the word first. The word first in Hebrew is rashit. But the word here is ikad. The word rashit is used for first, like the firstborn child mm -hmm. or the first fruits. That's the word Rashid. It's not a cod. But the word used here for first is actually referring to a part of this principle of the four basic gases that are listed here in these uh, the, the, the what we would consider the seven days. And they're building blocks, all they are, they're just building blocks, it's just showing us how we are constructed simply because uh, you have to think through this. We are constructed because we are built to be what? What are we built to be? God. We're built to be God. We're built to be the house God lives in. We're built to be the mobile God in this dimension. That's what we're built to be. And I want to say this right here because I need to say it right. We're not built to be an animal. And we are not an animal. But we constantly compare ourselves to an animal. And I'll show you very clearly... Did you under, do you know, most I bet you none of you know, even know this, the word animal is not in the Bible. It ain't there. You, I know you thought it was, but it is not there. Even when Noah did his thing? No, animal ain't there. Really? The word animal is not in the Bible. Just go find it sometime. See if you can find it. I'd like to see it. If you can find it, I'd like to see it. It ain't there. We constantly compare ourselves to an animal. And we constantly call ourselves an animal, and we constantly say we act like an animal. That is not true. We act ignorantly of who we are. And when we compare ourselves to something we are not, we reduce ourselves down to the level of that. That probably imparts some of the activity that we engage in animalistic. <laughs> but you're not an animal. It tells you very clearly right here what you are. Yeah. And I want to tell you this, and I'll show you that I can show you many places in the scripture where you can see this for yourself. You are not compared to an animal, you are compared to a tree. And this is this is saying we're that if this is the first principle, is that saying we're yod? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Part of that those four Hebrew glyphs. Part of the, those four glyphs that uh, build the we're looking at building the tabernacle that God houses itself in. We are the house of God, and God lives inside here. We may not extract 
the knowledge of who we are and what we are, most of the time we don't. And, and I'll say this, and, and I, I remember Sally asking last month when I said, I said, we're stuck. And, and I said, we're going to get unstuck. And I remember she said, oh, how where are we going to get unstuck? Well, we are stuck, but most of us don't know where we're stuck, don't realize what we're stuck in. We're stuck in our carnality. We're stuck in our flesh. But our flesh is not the flesh of an animal. Our flesh is made of different. The flesh of an animal is not the flesh of a fish. It's just like it tells you in Corinthians. There's the flesh of this, and the flesh of this, and the flesh of this. We are unique. We are different. We are designed as the image of God itself. That's why we are a rung above all of the other creation. That's why we are, quote, have dominion. But we don't know what to do or how to do that. And, but we're learning. We have to be waking up to who we are. We have to begin to fine-tune ourselves into what we have. We are, Psalms 1, we're like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Isaiah says we're like a tree that claps its hands. Mm -hmm. So if you want to compare yourself to any of the creation of God, compare it to what God compares you to. God compares you and me to a tree. So we should have four strand DNA. No, two. No, double. Okay. No, it's just, it's, no. It's, these four gases builds that. Okay. These four gases will build that. Okay, let's read on a little bit further. Because we'll, com we'll, comp we'll compare the first and the second. We'll pull the first and the second. <coughs> the word day is misleading here, very misleading. But if I use the word yom in Hebrew, then realize it means facets of life. Facets of life. Modes of life. So I can have abundant life. I can have happy life. Sad, sad to say, I can have I can have sad life and long life and long life. And, and yeah, and the word is used that way. That word yom is used like that. But then the translators, King James forty seven, quote scholars that were putting this compilation together the way he wanted it. They didn't do it the way that it should have been done. They didn't. But nevertheless. The Hebrew glyphs are still there, and we can find out what it really meant. You know, I used to get so frustrated at the translation years ago, trying to sit down and you know, you, and and I don't know why I had such a hunger to just do these word searches. But I see now why I did it, and if I hadn't have, if I hadn't have done that, and it just passed over it, it would not have meant anything to me like it does now. And so now I'm not upset with those guys that translated. They just did what they were told to do. They didn't know any different, and that's okay. It does make it a little more difficult to try to find out really what it said, really what it was trying to convey. But once you get in the flow of it, you realize, well, wait a minute, now, just because it reads that way doesn't mean that it's that way. Well, mm -hmm. you know, I've always wondered from the start how a Hebrew word can mean so many different things. You know, when you look it up, it's got, some of them have 29 different words there that it could mean. Mm -hmm. Well, they, the, trans, the translators did. Right. Like, for instance, yeah. most people use Strong's. Yeah. That's most people use Strong's Hebrew Greek dictionary. Yeah. And, and that's where you get the diversity of meaning. Yeah. Really, it doesn't, it doesn't. You have 22 Hebrew glyphs. Each one of them are different facets of energy. Right. And so you can break them down. That's why I put these two right here on the board. Alif, this, is, this one is number one. And of course, as being number one, we always refer to God. So we call this, this glyph at, in a reference as God. Yeah. And then this one, it is number, number 10. And so... In reference, we call it material, material, or the male slash female principle. Okay. So if we if we if we could get that, if we can understand that, that, and this is what everything is going to be about, everything. 
And so everything that we will begin to see will be about that right there. It's going to be about that we call God, source, yeah. okay. energy, essence, power, all the different terms. God sometimes not necessarily a good term because of the, <clears throat> the idea that we get when we see that. Yeah. As opposed to male, female. Okay. Now these are not contrary to each other and they're not in contradiction with each other. They're actually the two that learn the game and the dance. Because it's like I was trying to say last night, rather than for us to be in a war and a struggle, which we shouldn't be, most of the time we are, because that's what we've been taught. I mean, you know, we're a product of our teaching. I don't care who we are, we're a product of our teaching. And what we've been taught was an error. It wasn't an error on purpose, so I'm not upset with anybody. I'm not mad. I'm not pointing my fingers. I'm not trying to throw off or put down the preachers or the teachers or parents or anybody that did what they did. They did what they did because they didn't know to do any different. <laughs> right? Just like we did. exactly like <laughs> I did. Yeah. You did. We did no different. And so... We can plead innocence through ignorance. And that is the truth. But it's time to no longer be ignorant because ignorance is not bliss. I'm telling you, ignorance is the worst curse that we can have right now. Ignorance is our greatest problem. Ignorance is what keeps us in captivity. Ignorance is what keeps us going around and around the same mountain over and over again. And when we put on a different mind and we begin to raise ourselves up to the position that we are designed to be, not ignorant, but informed. With the proper information, you know what we would become? Powerful and not powerless. We would become strong. We wouldn't be weak. We would become healthy. We wouldn't be sick. We would be happy and we would not be sad. <laughs> and that's how we're built to be. That's, you know, this is supposed to be and should be and can be a paradise that's enjoyed. Not, not a hell that I'm trying to get out of. Right. Because we have been taught mostly through all religions, not just Christianity, Hindu, most all religions because they really got off of the path they were designed to be on because they were really, uh, in a, thousands of years ago, they were designed to be a path to teach us who we are as gods. We are the gods. We don't have to wait for the gods to come from another planetary system yeah. or an alien to come and be what we are. Right. Amen. <laughs> we, yes. we are the gods. We are the masters of the universe. We are. We were designed and created by God okay. to be that way by God. Yeah. Yeah. It's time for us to stand up and, and, and take our place right. and, and step up to the dance floor. And learn the dance, and that, you know that's what we're that's what we're learning to do. So everything is going to be about these two glyphs, the the Alif and the Yod, and, and you'll see that as we go through this a little further. I, at least I'm thinking you will. So let me read on a little bit more. Verse six, and God said, "Let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters." God made the ferment and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, and God called. See, you have to watch these places. When God calls something, He changes the name of it. And when there's a name change, we have to pay attention and learn what the name change is implying. Like, for instance, when He calls the, when he calls the light, and everything is an extension of that light, when He calls the light day, we need to pay attention to the day and not try to put it in a 24-hour period. Right. Period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's not. And yet we have been dumbed down to think that because we have all been taught and we embrace it, even not knowing how strong we embrace it, that this is a seven-day created thing. Six days of hard work and one day of feasting and having a, uh, a break. He just told us the earth is heaven. I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to show you that it is. Heaven and earth, same place. That's right. It's the same identical place. And it, yeah, it'll show you that, and you'll see that. It's not that difficult, but we'll see it. Okay. 
verse, uh, and God called the firmament heaven. The evening and the morning were the second, y'all. Okay, I'm just going to stop right there and let me go over my notes. I have so much here that I want you to I want to share with you. Uh, we're not just here. We're not just here to war, to fight, to battle. And, and I was taught in Christianity that that's what I'm supposed to do. Ephesians, Ephesians 6 used to be my motto. I'm not wrestling with flesh and blood, with but with principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness. And so, so if I'm in this wrestling mode and I keep myself in this wrestling mode, I'm going to continually fight. Well, when, if, and I, and I, if God don't fight them all the time, why should I? God ain't fight nothing. Yeah. yeah. God's yeah. never been in a war. God's never been in a struggle. God's never been fighting anything. We get caught in that. We get caught in that because it becomes a, a Christian <coughs> gymnastic exercise. And we didn't realize that we were in. So, we're not here to war, to fight, to battle, or to struggle. And, you know, it just really grabbed me when I looked up the definition of the word struggle. And the definition of it is to make forceful or violent effort to get free of restraint or constriction. It means to engage in conflict. And I realized I looked at my life, I looked at my life back over the last 40-something years, 40 plus years, that's what I call a Christian, and I realized that was a constant struggle because I was constantly trying to struggle to get free from all of the things that Christianity told me that I need to get free from because I didn't need to either be doing them or I didn't need to be engaging in this or that and the other, and so it was just so many do's and don'ts which caused my life to be a constant struggle. may not have been that way with you, but I, I was doing it out of purpose because I thought that's what I'm supposed to do. Warfare against the devil. <laughs> I remember 25, 30 years ago, and I've used this illustration many times, I used to meet there at the church in Dalton and I, you know, with, with any of the people who would come with me and we were going to do warfare. Right. We're going to do spiritual warfare. And that spiritual warfare was I would get in that, in that sanctuary and I would pace around. We would do this for over an hour. It's usually an hour, hour and a half. We would pray in tongues. We would, I would just fight with the devil. I command you to get out of here, to get away from this. And to, I mean, you know, we, we really worked up a lather. <laughs> We'd get all sweated up and, and uh, screaming and hollering. And on our, I, I mean, earnest and sincere. Didn't know we were dead wrong. <laughs> you know, but still earnest and sincere because that's what we were taught. We were trained to do that and didn't know. Whereas if we had known, we could have just come in there and peacefully loved on God and say, Father, we just want to dance with you. Mm -hmm. And if we'd have spent an hour learning the moves of the dance. Yeah. Or if we just spent time just saying, Okay, Father, I'm not sure how to play this game of life. Give me some instructions and teach me. And I settled myself down. I could, I could have learned some things that would have benefited me more. So, it's not a struggle. This is, should never be a struggle. Yet most of us do. We do. We struggle through ignorance or through the lack of instructions. Uh, we wind up being struggle. We are here to play. Really? And I remember hearing... A number of years ago, I heard Esther Hicks, Abraham, through Esther, saying that. Said, you're here to play. And I thought, well, that's a very unique idea. And I didn't. I just sloughed it off. But then I began to realize as I read the, the scripture, and I began to see, wow, that is true. If I show up to play, that means I'm not going to be of a mind that's filled with labor. Yeah. If I show up, the, what is it to play? You know what? My my first thought on to play, I'm gonna have fun doing this. Mm -hmm. A game should be fun. <clears throat> yeah. Celebrate life. That's what yeah. Doing. It should not be laborious. It should not be a struggle. I don't think I know many people that's not in a struggle. I think most people I know is in a struggle. Why? Yeah. That they don't realize they purpose to be in that struggle. They think that that's what they have to do. I, I, that's what I, I, that was me. That was me. 
We are here to play the game of life, to dance with the master and to be trained or to be taught in the rules of the game and to learn the moves of the dance. Ignorance is not bliss. It is devastating. It keeps us in the struggle or it keeps us in a war or it keeps us constantly in a fight mode. Therefore, we get stuck in our stuff. So whatever stuff you have, we get stuck in it. And most of that stuff, we, uh, we adopted it. We learned it. We became addicted to it by the time we were 12 year old. By the time we completed that cycle of the flesh. And we, most of us did not, at the age of 12, come out of that material mothering concept and go to the Father's house or in other words, go to the place to learn the spiritual principles to implement them in this dimension. Most of us didn't do that because most of us never were taught that. And I never heard of that. But it's simple and it's clear and it's right in front of us. If we, You see, the 12, the 12, when Jesus was 12 and he was found in the temple, he was 12 years old, and he was found in the temple, and he said, he's, if mom and daddy come looking for him, it took them three days to find him, or two days to find him and a day to get him back. And he said, look, he said, I, I'm not about that. I'm about my father's business now. That's a, that's a principle for you and me. That's the place. And I don't care if we're 50 or 70 or 100 and we've been stuck in that 12-year-old cycle. How many of y'all ever seen a 75-year-old act like a 12-year-old? <laughs> I'd be one. I'd be one. I'd be one. Repeated something I did when I was 10, 11, 12 because I acted that way. I stuck in that. I, I thought that way. <laughs> but now, if I'm going to put on a different mind, I've got to think different, and that's what I've got to do. I've got to put on a different mind. I can't see through the glasses I saw through. When I was a child, I acted that way. Why don't I stop acting that way? Because I'm stuck in that way. <laughs> so what I'm doing is I'm going to learn not, I'm going to learn, I'm not an animal. <laughs> I'm not. I am a divine creature. But you're going to look like you're 12 years old because you're feeling the joy that you felt when you were 12 years old. Well, there's one thing to embrace the joy, but it's another thing to get stuck in the anger or the conflict oh, yeah. of that. No, no. You yeah. don't get... Yeah, because yeah. that's childish. That's you what don't Paul get said. Bad and you don't get... Don't get my way, bless yeah. God, I'm old pal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Be me. Yeah, yeah. If it don't work for the way I plan for it to work... Yeah. Bless God, they yeah. good around here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't let politics. That's what I'm talking about when I say being stuck. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about being in a struggle. That I should not be stuck there, and I should not have a struggle there. I do. <sighs> I I know you do too. You look at me like y'all would. He's he's a beautiful shape. <laughs> you poor thing. Yeah. <laughs> stuck in my stuff. Poor thing. Stuck in my stuff. Getting free from my stuff. I'm getting out of fight mode. Oh, I'm gonna let go and let God. Amen. That's right. That's what I mean. You know, that's a little phrase, a catchphrase that we all heard. I'm gonna let go and I'm gonna let God. I'm gonna quit. Ain't gonna do no war no more. <laughs> there you go. Amen. Amen. Ain't no need to war no more. The battle's been won. There's no need to fight a battle. I can remember, I, I, I thought Jesus defeated the devil, then why in the hell am I such a fight with him? Yeah. Yeah. You you, I mean, you remember that? I mean, mm -hmm. surely you remember that? Yeah. I mean, all of you Copelandites and uh, Haganites, yeah. I, I mean, I did, I, I always wondered that. I always questioned, why are we fighting him since Jesus done whooped him, supposedly? Right. <laughs> if he whooped him and disarmed him and dismantled him, I mean, you know, we just, we just stuck in our stuff. <laughs> Uh, there is a, there is a cosmic, spiritual, and a human drama playing with each other. These two fundamental natures are this right here: the olive and the olive. Uh, uh, let's see how many. This this with this this olive and this yod represent the two fundamental natures. The fundamental natures are spiritual spiritual and material. 
I mean, these are the two fundamental natures, period. I mean, yeah. everything, everything is locked into that, but yet they're not separate. No. We have them divided in Christianity. We have spiritual plumb out there in a place that we can't get to. That's where God is. That's divine. And we have the material down here in this physical world and the twain never can reach. And that ain't true. Right. They, they, you, they, you never can have one without the other. Nope. You, have, you cannot have a material without a spiritual. And you can't have a spiritual without a material. Right. You have nothing. You have to merge the two together. The two right. learn to move in this dance. And this dance is called yom. It's called life. Abundant life. Yeah. Happy life. Fulfilled life. Long life. So this, these two, we have to watch these glyphs, the alif and the yom. We have to watch them as we begin to see them as we, comp we compile or put together these Hebrew glyphs. That's how you make a word. See, that's... that's the, the Jews understand that better. Sad to say, the most of them don't. Sad right. to say they don't. You know right. what? Right. Because they have left their ancient roots of understanding these glyphs, not as a language, but as a formula or a code of energy. They represent right. the energy or the essence or the quintessence God. Yeah. And so to say God is to reduce down the ether, the energy, the, right. the, the all in all, the everywhere. The ep to say God, so often we reduce it down to just an old man. Yeah. 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 And it's so much, so much more than that. Yeah. It, it's just so yes. much more than that. And so for us to look at this and start to re recognize these <laughs> glimpses and what they mean and what their essence is, is is, uh, is where we're at. So I want to take this one. I leave. I'm going to go ahead and separate that board right here and come back to verse 1. If you would look, look at verse 1, I'm going to take two words here out of this verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens. The heavens. The heavens. That's the Hebrew word heaven. Sheen. Okay. Mim. Yod. Final men. Okay? And this is the word for heavens. Or heaven. Okay? Okay. Sheen, mem, yod, mem. That's the word for heaven. And the next word is what? Earth. Mm -hmm. Yep. The earth. And so that's the one that we want to look at that one. Earth is spelt with its irrets, alif. Rash, Tassada. And so this is how you spell earth. And here's what we want to pay attention to. That glyph and that glyph. Because the dance, the game, is between the alif and between the yod. So the alif in the Hebrew word eres, that's translated for the word earth, and the yod in the Hebrew word shamayim, which is translated heaven. What these two words mean in Hebrew is not what you and I have been taught and been told they mean in English. So we have to come back. We have to take the alif, which is the ether, the essence, the all in all, the power, etc. And we've termed it God. We've called that God. And the Yod, which is between the two mims, the reason it's between the two mims, it refers to the waters above and the waters below. And it's a, co it's a compilation to pull those waters together. The waters below, the, the mim 40, is the where you, anytime you see a story with the number 40 in it. Whether it's Jesus going on a 40 day fast, Moses wandering with people for 40 years. Yeah. Anywhere you find that word 
40 or a mem word, that word mem, whether it's, whether it's 40 mem or final mem, anywhere you find it, <coughs> always it's referring to material to materiality. Always. It's always referring to the physical, material, manifest world. And always when you see the Alif, it's always referring to the divine or the cosmic or the spiritual world. And you and they're not separate. You can't divide them. You have to, you've got to begin to see. It's the it's the male, the female. It's the principle of the phallic and the only. It's the principle of the plus and the minus. It's the principle of the right and the left. See, every one of us, I, I mean every, every one of us, more human, especially humanity, everything in nature carries this principle of the olive and the old. Everything in nature, down to the lowest, smallest little living thing, whatever it is. Everything in nature carries this principle right here between the Aleph and the Yod. But we are different. We not only carry this principle, we have been given a higher order of this principle, and that is we have been given this psychological, we've been given this mind, this ability to think, to plan, to do the different things that the rest of creation, none of creation does that. None of them. And our problem is we aren't putting on all that we have to put on. We're not thinking through all that we have to think through with. We're not using our divine essence as our divine essence has been given to us to use. And so, uh, even though we live and move and have our being from this essence, I mean, this essence is, is that which lives me. And the way it lives me, and it lives me unconsciously. I don't even know it's living me unless I pay attention to it. And it's through my two breaths, which in the Song of Solomon refers to it as the two breasts. The two breasts are not referring to the two breasts. They're referring to the two breaths. Inhale. Exhale. As I'm pulling, inhale, from the divine, the, I think I'm exhaling and releasing, not knowing the divine is pulling from me. It's an exchange. Yeah. It's an equal exchange. Right. It's God exchanging His life for my life. It's me exchanging my life for God's life. And we're constantly, and this is not a struggle. No. We have made a struggle out of it. This is a dance. This is a game. And as I learn to play this game, then I will learn the, the rules, the steps in the game. And as I learn the steps, and hallelujah, I can, uh, I can begin to be what God designed me to be. So, we'll see the, this word, heaven. To the ancients, this word, the word heaven to the ancients never meant that out there. Ever. It, it never did. And so even when they would use the word heaven or shamayim in ancient Hebrew, they weren't referring to something out there at all. They were actually referring to an ether or they understood it was a life principle. So, you know, they were referring to the, again, the, the yud between the two mems. That's just exactly like that uh, dance or that flow between my two breaths, between yeah. the breath of the inhale, the breath of the exhale. And learning to learn is that to, basically saying that we are the firmament, firmament between the two. Yeah, waters. we are. We sure are. And we'll the get into the waters within and the waters without. Exactly. We will get into the word firmament too, and that's a very. I mean, you know, that word firmament in the Hebrew is very, very. Uh, I heard a guy teach on. I thought, my goodness, that's that's really sad that people get up and teach on these words firmament and don't really do the research. They can do it. I mean, anybody can do the research if they want to. It just takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. dig it out and you can, you can see it. Okay, uh, let's move on. I want you to, with me, if you go to Psalms, Psalms mm -hmm. chapter 1. And in verse 8, before we leave there, it, it says, God called the firmament heaven. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, capital H with the heaven. This is what he called it. God said, here's what the firm did. So what is the firm? You've got to see that. Now see, the heaven, the heaven is the type of your lower nature and your upper nature. Heaven is a type of your material nature and your divine nature. That's what the word heaven yeah. means. It's, it, it's two words. It's sheen mem. That's your lower nature. Sheen represents breath. Regular mem, 40 mem, means material. Yod is the compilation. It's the spiritual union between the male and the female principle with the glip final mem, 600 value, which gives it divine or spiritual copulative ability. You know what the second day is. You hear that? You hear that? Spiritual copulative ability. I, I hope you can grab that because that means it has the divine power to constantly create and it does. You create in your own world. Whether you like it or you don't like it. Why? Because you have this Yod final meal. Yeah. That's your higher nature. So here is your lower nature and your higher nature combined together in one beautiful word. Shamayim in Hebrew. Yeah. I'd rather say it that way than to say heaven because everybody gets so far off track when you say the word heaven. You can't even say the word heaven without somebody's brain takes a trip out of chapter somewhere or it'll be go nowhere. And then the rest of that carries <coughs> on and it says, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Amen. And, and that principle is our awakening from the darkness to the second day. Yeah. It's coming to the light. Amen. Coming, that's right. Coming into the light. And we are. Yep. Uh, well, while you're right here, before you go to Psalms, if you're by Psalms, are you, yeah. you're still in Genesis. You've got your finger in both places. Look at verse 26. And God said, let us make man. Now, God didn't say that about the animal kingdom. What did you fix? Look at verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. Jump back to Genesis. Genesis 1, 26. I'm going to go over to Psalms. I will go to Psalms 1, 2. But Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man as our image. He didn't say I'm going to make a fish in my image. As my image. He didn't say I'm going to make an animal as my image. Cow, dog, horse. He didn't say I'm going to make the bird as my image. He didn't say I'm going to make the trees, I'm going to make the plants as my He said I'm going to make man. I'm going to make Atom as my image. Isn't the sheen supposed to be the image of God? No, the sheen is the bread. Sheen is the bread. The alif is the one that image. Okay. It's the number one. The sheen, it has a 300 value. And, you know, at 300, okay. and it where am I? Is my board trying to fall? It's okay. <laughs> I thought I felt it slip one way. The sheen has a 300 value. It has uh, it has spirit, soul, and body. It co it compares the all of it through the breath. Okay. So it always that, that's the breath. And the breath many times is compared to the spirit. So in that well, in that essence, it is compared to God in that light. But no, verse 26, and God said, "Let us make man." as our image, in our image, as our image. Okay, then then go with me to Psalms. Psalms chapter 1. And I, and I know you guys already know all this. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Verse 1, uh, Psalms 1, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like, here's what man is like. He shall be like a tree. Man is to be like a tree. There's so many comparisons to that. If I go back to Genesis chapter 2, and I see, and I, I will try to show you this, if we have the time, I try to look at it. These translators that worked for King James that did not know Hebrew, and and like Phil was saying, that they will go to a concordance like a Strong's or 
Young's or Genesis, analytical, whatever concordance that they use. They go to many of these different concordances and see so many different names, so many different definitions for the same word. They say, wow, how in the world does that work? So it really don't. It was there. When they use the word beast for the same word as the word tree of life, you know, you should have some kind of a flag or signal or something yeah. go off yeah. in your head and say, wait a minute. Yeah. Because if I'm thinking of a beast, I thought the tree, I thought Jesus represents the tree of life. That Jesus is yeah. a symbol of the tree of life. I thought that the essence of all that God is a symbol of the tree of life. It is. But then why would you want to take the word che, which is the tree of life, and then take that he, beautiful Hebrew word che, che god, and then translate it for the word beast? Because when you think beast, you're thinking of an ox, a wild animal, a mad dog. A, a lion eating everything. There's the tree of life in that 300 word. Yeah, well, it is. It is. But they did that, and they do that. And that's why I think that's where so much confusion is coming in. Yeah. And we have had, and we have, we have honest, sincere, phenomenal, godly men and writers that I read, that I enjoy, that I love, many of them, and they still compare me to a beast. And I'm not a beast. That's right. I'm not an animal. Okay. And you're not. None of us they are animals. Lord to the lower nature. I mean, they do refer to the Lord. But the lower nature of you is a divine. Yeah. There's nothing about you that's less than anything else about you. Just because you're material, you're physical. Right. But yet we look at it that way. We're trained to see it that way. We're trained to look at it as degrading, debased. <laughs> and that's why we call it an animal. <laughs> we, we, it, animal you can't hear animalistic. We, we, you can't hear what we heard already this morning and think any any less of ourselves. Uh, but we do. We 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 honestly do. We don't function out of what we are. Mm -hmm. we sure do. That's what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say. If that's how you think that you are, if that's how I think that I am, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to act out of that. I'm going to act out of that. That's what I'm. That's my point yeah. exactly. If I can understand, I'm made as the image of God. I am made in the divine purpose, and my my whole purpose in this in this dance, in this manifestation, in this game that I'm playing, is to be divine, not to be animal, not to be bestial. If I want to compare myself to anything, let, compare me to a tree, and a tree is a very good analogy. Because of the part of the tree you do see and the part of the tree you don't see, and they're not separate. Mm -hmm. Their life is from the same source. Yeah. Okay? So even though I may compare myself to an animal, that's not a good comparison. Because if I do, I'm going to think I act that way. Yeah. When all the time, you know, it's like we are taught that that's wrong. That's evil. We shouldn't do that. And there is no wrong or evil. There are things that didn't work, and if I can see yeah. them, as, you know, that didn't serve me too good. <laughs> I, I mean, to really take a second look at that scenario and how I come out through that, I, you know, I don't think I will necessarily repeat that. If I can see that with an open eye and I can look at it and train myself, teach myself, instruct myself, look, yeah. I'm not designed to act that way. I'm designed to act in a higher mode mm -hmm. of thinking than that. I get stuck there, don't I? <laughs> and you know what then I do? Since I'm stuck there, I'm struggling there. Yeah. I'm talking to me. I'm not yeah. I, 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 and I, I'm looking in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Because you see, if I don't have a mirror to look into, then I don't know my image. My mirror reflects my image. If I'm looking into a mirror and I'm seeing an animal... You know what I'm reflecting? An animal. If I'm looking into a mirror and all I see is the divine nature, because that's really what I am, that's who I'm designed to be like, and I'm going to draw on that. That's just that's how we're designed to be. We're designed to do that. Oh, uh, the animal is it, like I said, it's not even found in the Bible at all. 
And actually, the word was not even coined until 1540. That's when you can find this out. That's when the word animal was coined in 1540. And it was pertaining to, or is derived from the beast. It was pertaining to sensation, which is an animal including the human's detection of extreme ex external or internal stimulation. That's where that word sensation came from. It's external or internal stimulation. And it's different from the word perception. You see, an animal and a human can be stimulated, but a human has a perception that an animal does not have. We don't use it. You know why when we compare ourselves to an animal, we act like an animal through sensation. If you'll think through this with me, you'll go back and look in your life. All of those moments that we have acted animalistic through fighting and warring and those things that I did, yeah. that I do, and usually those wars are in my, up here. They're not up here. They're here. They're my mind. There ain't nowhere my mind is, is not at. My mind's in my feet. My mind's in my loins. Yeah. My mind is in my organs. Ain't nowhere my mind's not. It's just not just in my brain. My brain is an organ just like my kidneys. My bladder. Yeah. They're, they're organs, but they have mind. They have the mind. And then all the mind does, the mind is just an instrument that stimulates thoughts. I don't just think in my brain, I think through my whole body organ, through my whole temple. So I'll read this to you again. This animal is not even in the Bible, it did not even come into use until 1540, and it was pertaining or derived from the beast. It was pertaining to sensation, <coughs> which is an animal, which is animals, and includes humans. Uh, it's detection of external or internal stimulation. It is different from perception, which is about making sense of or describing the stimulation. An animal can't do that. You can. You can make sense of it. You can look at, you can look at your own action. I'm looking long and hard at mine. Thank God. I mean, I'm, I'm in the best place I have been in my life up until now, period. You know why? Because I am beginning to open my eyes up to the stupid things that I have done, the things that never served me, and I still did them anyway. And I am right now, at my right young age, or wherever that is, I am right now waking up, and I'm beginning to see me as me. And sometimes I don't really like what I see because I have a been what God put me together to be. And it's like, it's time for me to stand up and be counted for me. Yes. So I can make a good perception if I have the proper instructions and the information to make it win. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm assimilating that. I'm seeing that for me. The beast, the first place that we see the use of this word is in Genesis chapter 7. And it's the word behemoth. You all have heard of the behemoth, haven't you? It's the word for, it's the word beast. It's, it's behemoth in the Hebrew. And actually it just simply means a dumb, a dumb beast. And the, the reason it means dumb is they can't talk. Now, okay. Easton can. Yes. <laughs> the babies can. You all understand? <laughs> but they can, but they can. They talk through their eyes, they talk through their bar, their movement stuff. But in reality, they can't talk. Be nice they could. That's what separates you from me. Uh, that's what separates us from them. They talk back to us. Yeah. Through, through yeah. what they do. Exactly. Through what they, but by, by when the it uses this, this phrase, behemoth, that's what the word means. It's a non speaking flesh. Right. That's, that's what it means. Uh, and then in Genesis 31 we have another Hebrew word. It's called terafah. 
And actually it just means to uh, pray. And these are words that's translated for the word beast in Scripture. They're not the same. They don't ever mean the same. Like for instance, this word behemoth just simply means it doesn't speak. It doesn't talk. Yes, it's flesh. And in many respects, the flesh is similar to my flesh. But it's not human. It's, it doesn't have perception. It doesn't have the ability to talk and to communicate. Was Jack we Dash do. one of them? Huh? Was Jack Dash one of the words? Uh, no, I... I <laughs> behemoth. <laughs> Terrafa was another one. And actually, this just simply means a prey or a raven or it just simply means meat torn apart. It's just like this word is like where you would see a lion going after uh, an elk and ripping the hind quarter of it. That's what that word means. It just means torn flesh. That's really what it refers to. And there's a third place that the Hebrew word is used for beast. And this word is actually found in Genesis chapter 2. And it's the word che. And it actually means life. The tree of life, same word, but yet they use the word beast. So you can hear the difference, especially the translators when they begin to do this translating, and they compared us to a beast. They tried to make us an animal into an animal, and we're not. We never were designed to be that way. We're not designed to be that way. We're designed to be as God designed us to be, divine. We're designed to be. To be able to communicate. That's you know, that's what God is looking for us to be with Him. Communicate. To open our hearts and our minds and to communicate. Okay, so I I'm just gonna quit right here. Okay. All right. I don't know how far we are. Okay. okay. Any questions? But it's always a choice. <laughs> yes, everything in life is a choice. It's not right or wrong. <coughs> choices aren't right or wrong. They're choices. They may not bring the results that we want. They may. But everything, everything. I said before you, life and death. Choose. Life and death doesn't mean you can say right or wrong. No. It's, it's an experience. And that experience is what we're here for. We're here for that experience. That experience is, it's like, you know, uh, how many times did Edison find the ways that a bulb wouldn't work? How many? I've heard 1,100. Yeah. yeah, hundreds of times. 1,100 ways that a bulb, was he wrong? He never was wrong. He found ways that didn't work. How many ways have I found that certain things don't work? If I go back and look and count the ways I found it didn't work to pay attention. I just quit doing some of those things. Yeah. You know, but yes, you're right. It's always a choice. Everything is a choice. Well, that's what I was trying to say at the uh, table last night of uh, interpretation of words, right, wrong, salt, pepper, and uh, the opposites and everything. That um, everything is a, a ladder of going up to yourself, you know, going into the light and everything. So. That's where it's caused so much uh, hurt and insanity is because they think it's wrong or simple. And, that, and it, it's caused such a turmoil in the mind and that. And, um, and instead of it being a life of gay and happiness and everything, it's right and wrong. And that, and that, and then you go under condemnation because you, you didn't get that light bulb a zillion times, you don't realize you can't, and when you get so tired, you give up because uh, you haven't been able to make the right, uh, the right choice, you think, because of the wrong teachings, and that's, uh, it has caused death and uh, unhappiness yes. in yourself. Yeah. In yourself. Yeah. And, yes. that, and that's I was saying that and there is no wrong and there is no sin, and, that, and it's all uh, a discovery mm -hmm. of yourself. My grandpa, he would, he used to just constantly say, he said, I'd rather hear you cuss than say you can't or to say you quit. He said, I don't ever want to hear you say you can't, and I don't ever want to hear you say I quit. He said, I had rather hear you cuss 
and he was really my grandfather was a real firm yes. man. I mean, you know, he was a, he was my mentor, and I loved him dearly. But dear Lord, he was a hard man to he was a hard taskmaster. But the principles are there. Yeah. Never say I can't, yeah. and never say I quit. That's beautiful. Don't give up. Yeah. Because because we can. Yes. Yes. Definitely that. Yeah, yes. religion has. Stopped. I'd rather show up at eighty and start to get it right than to just flounder around and go on past eighty mm -hmm. and never ever get it right. Just stay stuck in the same thing I was in twelve when I was twelve year old. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I only way I'm gonna do that, I gotta open my mind and not yeah. think the way I've always thought. Yeah. Because I'm gonna constantly mm -hmm. get the same thing I've always got thinking the way I always thought. Yeah. 